Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we want to try and make this session um, quite interactive. Um, the, the whole Peatlands conference is about the landscape approach, so I'm going to I hope the cameras don't mind if I walk around. Is that, is that okay? Um, so I know that this is a youth meeting, um, and uh, but the, a lot of this meeting is really about what we understand by the landscape approach. So I'm going to ask for a sort of show of hands. Do people understand the landscape approach because we've kind of run out of ideas in terms of other initiatives? Show of hands. No? OK. Excellent. Do we, <laughs> do we understand the landscape approach as being a much more integrated um, uh, ideal or concept or framework to break down silos of forestry, agriculture, and other land uses? Yes, there's one hand, at least two, three, four. OK, fine. Do we understand landscape approaches as being um, a, a better way to integrate conservation and development, which has been a systematic failure in many aspects uh, across the tropics, in terms of integrating conservation and development in meaningful ways for better environmental outcomes and livelihood outcomes? Well, there's, there's one or two hands going up. So basically, I can surmise that there are very, very many different um, uh, definitions, understandings of the landscape approach, and I think that's the very essence in what the landscape approach is. It means different things to different people. Um, it means that it is almost beyond definition, and one of the things we've tried to, to do is avoid defining the landscape approach. And one of the reasons that we do that is because there's no silver bullet. We think of the landscape approach as having a, a broad implementation framework, some basic concepts that we have uh, that are based on sound science, but focus on the context of where we're working as well. So there's no silver bullet per se. Is it possible to have the first slide up? And I, and I think I dropped the um, slide changer. Oh, you have it. So Moses, coming down from Mount Sinai, forgive the cultural um, context here, but came down with 10 commandments. and. When I first joined CIFRA in 2006, we started to unravel the landscape literature, and what constantly came out were a series of principles and guidelines for how to manage landscapes. But mostly, from an ecological perspective, the social side was missed, the food security issues were missed, the ecological services were missed. But these guidelines and approaches really focused on um, if you like, um, issues of wildlife corridors, how to maintain the biological and biophysical integrity of the landscapes concerned. Um, and over a period of years, many, many consultations... Okay, okay thank you. Uh, many years of consultations with partners, surveys, etc. We came up with a, bro a more broad concept, a more broad framework of, of landscape approaches which became known as the 10 principles, if you can just. And those 10 principles um, were designed to basically reconcile issues of agriculture, conservation, and other competing land uses, as you can see. Um, next uh, bit of animation. And so these 10 principles here form what we think of as a framework, a broad framework for implementing um, the landscape approach on the ground to integrate many, many different land uses, reduce conflicts, achieve consensus, and get people to agree what happens in that landscape can have optimized outcomes. So essentially drawing together a whole framework of understanding, and many of these principles and approaches were developed by working with people in the field. We started by consulting conservation organizations, development organizations. We started to develop a consensus of what, really means, what it really means in the field to work at the landscape scale. So basically getting people to think beyond their protected areas, beyond their development projects, beyond their mining concessions, beyond their forestry concessions, um, into a much more holistic understanding of what the landscape that they work in represents. And of course in those landscapes you have influences from the inside, you have influences from outside. These may be policy related, they may be economic, they may be social, maybe social conflict. And this paper was published in 2013 and really resonated both with the scientific community who've been you know, trying to understand how do we develop these frameworks from a perspective of a more holistic approach, moving away from the purely biophysical into the social, into the food security, into the much more 
broad-based uh, uh, frameworks that you see here. And gratifyingly, these frameworks have actually been used as implementation tools for projects here in Indonesia. So the USAID Lestari project has adopted this approach, this framework, for the implementation of their Lestari project in six landscapes in Indonesia. Conservation International have also used these principles in guiding frameworks for their sustainable landscapes partnerships. So we're seeing that the conceptual approach, which has been drafted from a bottom-up perspective, published in high-level literature, is now feeding back down into the field and being actually adopted and used. One of the best descriptions that I uh, have heard um, for the landscape approach is that you have lots of competing interests, lots of competing issues, and it's a bit like jazz. Now, this is probably a bit of a young audience, do, but do many people here like jazz? Hands up. No, we should have gone for an older crowd, clearly. So with, with jazz, <laughs> at the very outset of a, of a particular um, session, the musicians will decide on the key. They want to know the key of the, the music. A rough end point, you know, how long will the music last? But from getting from A to B, everybody does their own thing. But at the very outset, there's agreement in how to achieve the end product by following a basic structure, and that's the key, and the syncopation, and even though there's all that improvisation, at the end, there's agreement in how that jazz manifests itself in a wonderful music endeavor. And that's pretty much what the landscape approach is about. It's about understanding an agreed compromise, if you like, uh, an agreed consensus of opinion of what that landscape should be like in 10, 20 years, and how it can fulfill the terms of everybody and all the stakeholders concerned. So those stakeholders may be mining companies, they may be logging companies, they may be pure conservationists, they will obviously be local people who have obviously very different views to those other entities. How can you reconcile all of those in a single landscape? And it's usually through facilitation, consensus building, um, and, and building a process of mutual understanding and trust. And these things are often not the case in many of the landscapes that, that, that we work in on the ground. So that's the basic introduction to the landscape approach. One of the things we're, we're attempting to do now, the next stage for us, is to evaluate how we can use these frameworks on the ground. What are the perils, pitfalls? What are the institutional constraints? What are the human constraints? What are the financial constraints? And how can we feed that back into the conceptual frameworks that we've been developing. So a feedback loop from the field to science, and science being refined to feed back, straight back into the field uh, for better implementation and more effective implementation, if that makes sense. And the last thing I'll say is the, the beauty of the, dynamic, the um, landscape approach is it's not a project. We need to think beyond projects. Projects typically are two or three, five years in duration. The landscape approach is a process. It's a process by which we invest in a landscape and we use the, the platforms that are there already and exploit them so that they're actually there for everybody else's mutual benefit, and exploit is not the right word, I didn't mean that word, um, to basically facilitate dialogue between potentially conflicting uh, actors, but also get a dialogue where there's long-term funding agreed, um, shared visions in terms of investments, shared visions in terms of a, a long-term approach. It's a dynamic process. There will be some losers, there will be some winners. But basically, the whole point of the landscape approach is to integrate, facilitate, and aim for much more um, equitable um, and focused human and environmental outcomes, as opposed to the broad trade-offs when you're looking at protected areas or commercial plantations. Or, or other land uses that are often very competing. What we need here is also the policy environment for that to happen. Um, and by the virtue of implementation, that's something that we want to work on. We're about to engage on a large project working in Indone Indonesia, Burkina Faso in, in the Sahel in Africa, and Zambia in southern Africa, to look at those exact things. What are the institutional characteristics that need to happen for this to work? What are the, what's the policy environment both nationally and globally? And one thing we want to feed into as we generate our research results, as we start to think about the optimum ways 
of implementing the landscape approach on the ground and feeding it back to the scientific community is how, and John will talk about this uh, in context of the GLF, how we use global forums and platforms like the Global Landscape Forum to disseminate that work for much broad-based uptake and adaptation and adoption. And I think I'll stop there and, and hand over back to the moderator. So thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you for Sander, Terry Sunderland for giving us the insight about the landscape approach. Now we have a John Colney as an executive producer for Landscape Forum and director of information and communication C4 to give us insight about global landscape forums. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much for joining us at the Global Landscape Forum today. I've been working with the International Forestry Students Association for about nine years, about the time I've been at C4. Um, we used to do, and we're very, very happy to have you here, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Global Landscape Forum, and we're going to try to hope that you can somehow join us uh, in the years ahead as your careers develop and as students. Um, the Global Landscape Forum came out of two different global conferences, and uh, one of them was Forest Day, I did my first one in Copenhagen, it used to be held alongside the COP, and another one was called Ag Day. Uh, different names for it over the years, but uh, that was done International Agriculture and Development Day, I think. Um, we had these two going in parallel at the COP, and at some point, I remember, if you've ever heard of Lord Stern, a great economist in London, he, we were at, in the throes of red, and this was in Cancun at the COP, and Lord Stern stood up at the Forest Day, and it was a big conference, uh, 3,000 people. And he said, if you guys don't figure out a way to get red into the development agenda, it's not going to succeed. You've got to broaden the, you've got to bring forestry into the development agenda. Uh, and that, at some point, there were different things. What you've just heard today is the foundation of the Global Landscape Forum, and Terry didn't mention he's uh, also a forester, uh, leading scientist in forestry and biodiversity. I also came from a forestry background. Um, but and my director general, Peter Holmgren, uh, also when he joined C4, he was one of the founders of RED, and he also saw that we needed to broaden forestry, and that's why our personal involvement at Global Landscape Forum, we had to broaden forestry to show the value of forest across all the SDGs. At the same time, and also we needed to be talking to agriculture. So what we did was, about four years ago, we started the Global Landscape Forum. We brought together Ag Day and Forest Day. The World Bank also started this, joined us, and UNEP joined us. And we started off with this idea, the Global Landscape Forum. So I'm going to tell you a little bit and where we are right now. We've just received uh, five years of support from the German government. We're about to scale up the Global Landscape Forum and it's going to become very, very large. And youth and students are a very big part of it. So where are we and what happened with the Global Landscape Forum? I'll talk a little bit about, we started the first one in Warsaw. We thought, I don't know, is anybody going to be interested in this? So we started, with, we thought we'd get 300 people. We had 1,200 people. We reached 1.2 million people online. And we thought, wow, this is interesting because something happened. Something happened when foresters started talking to ag, started talking to water, started talking to mountains. When we all the specialists started getting together, something special happened. It wasn't just foresters talking to foresters. And then uh, the next one was in Lima. In Lima, we, again, we thought we'd have 500, but suddenly we had 1,500, and again, at capacity. And it started getting larger, and we reached 3.6 million. And then we went to Paris at the COP, the big COP. And uh, we had 3,000 people showed up. It was supposed to be a very small event, and it was like uh, the, one of the event organizers called it, we haven't seen this, it was like a rock concert. So what was happening? That all this, all everyone had something to share, everyone wanted to talk. And we had indigenous groups, we had every parts of the landscape. And the landscape approach has always been the founding. So Germany and others have joined us, and now we're about to scale up. So we had at different times, we've had 3,000 organizations involved. Uh, you can see we've reached 32 million people, media, we had commitments to restore 128 million hectares of uh, degraded land in Africa. Mayors started showing up and they said they were going to protect watersheds. Go ahead. 
But this is, this is something neat. And this is when we thought there was something unique that's happening, and it's happening online. Now, this is something called the Gephi Network Graph. I'll go through it very quickly. But this was Lima. This is a Twitter cloud. And this is people, and you can see they're, they're not really connecting to each other. The conversation is all over the place. And then this is the next one, 6.7 million. That is Lima. So Lima is starting to become more interesting. Uh, this is Warsaw, that's Lima. And they're starting to, starting to become something. And then look at the next graph. This is Paris. Now this is where we start to think, wow, GLF can be something special. So use your imagination on this, but this is 3,000 people tweeting 5,000 tweets to each other over a two-day period and reaching 16 million people. And this is people like, uh, like Governor uh, Jerry Brown of California, the head of the BirdLife Society, all kinds of different groups talking and talking and taking on their own. So what do we do with this? And this is when we started thinking about, what's, let's go back to this old theory of community of practice. I don't know if you know that theory. It came in the late 90s. It was actually coming out of uh, business. And what happens if we could use the internet worldwide to connect all the like-minded people thinking in the same way? What, what could we create a community of practice? Most communities of practice are done with very small organizations. Maybe you can get up to 12,000. FAO has been done. But what if we could reach millions? And it was science-led. And it was at, with a strong foundation. So this is what we did. So our aspiration is to create a global community of practice. The global community of practice, these are the different parts of a community of practice if you go look it up. We have a shared concern, a holistic approach to achieving the SDGs and climate goals. We have the domain is the landscape approach, which you've just heard about. That's how, what we're all going to work on. That's our lens on how we approach things. And this is what's very important. We have a commitment to action. And that is we want to create sustainable landscapes across the world that are productive, profitable. They have to be profitable. They have to be profitable for smallholders. Otherwise, you'll know carbon is not going to feed people. We've got to make these things profitable. And they've got to be equitable. And that includes gender. And it has to be carbon positive or at least carbon neutral. Go ahead. What's our goal? We're thinking very, very big. We want to create a global movement. We want to create a global movement that's going to benefit, by 2030, 1 billion people. Now, that's a big idea. And we want ours, and this is in the world of where things are turning a little negative, particularly for my country, it's a positive vision. It's a positive vision for me. Now, I'm not an academic like Dr. Sunderland. For me, it's a positive vision. If you look at the Rift Valley, what could, it, what could the Rift Valley look like if we all worked together? What could the Terai in Nepal, what could, uh, Central Kalimantan or portions of, what could a peatland area landscape of 100,000 hectares look like if we all work together and we negotiate multiple benefits that will benefit all of us? That's the vision we're trying to create. Now, we're, we have a connection. We hope to connect 100,000 students in the next three or four years. We want to involve you. We want you to get involved with the Global Landscape Forum. We want you to come and join us at the various conferences where you'll be meeting the agriculture students, because there's another group like you that works on agriculture. And we've been working, YAPARD, I think it's called, right? Uh, YPARD, which is Young People in Agriculture Research and Development. Well, we've been working together with both of your organizations, and we're going to bring in others all around the world. And we want to work together. So we need you. We want you to be involved as your careers develop. Excuse me. Uh, please, look at this vision and look at what we could do. And we think we're going to be able to keep our forests and use them year after year after year to benefit all of us, as long as we get everyone else working with us. Thank you very much. Oh, OK. Um... Thank you for uh, Terrace in Netherlands and uh, John Comey for giving us a good insight this afternoon. And we are happy to have you here. And okay, we are going to uh, next agenda. Uh, we have uh, two speakers for talk about the environment. And we have uh, Lenny Aurora and Manuela Sinta. So, Lenny Aurora, can you come to the stage to give? Uh, yeah. 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 
Okay, so we got the presentation for our first speaker. Hello everyone, um, thank you, good afternoon and thank you very much for having me here. Um, sorry, first before we start, can I ask for the clicker from the uh, committee? Yes. So um, before we start, I want like to introduce myself. My name is Leonie Aurora. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Leonie Aurora. I'm from a movement called Hutan Itu Indonesia, or in English is um, Forest Are Indonesia. Forest is Indonesia. Well, yeah. Um, so when I first got this um, uh, this invitation to speak, I was asked to talk about activism and youth, and then I asked, so what do you want the participants to? come out feeling, and then the organizer said, well, it would be great if you can um, inspire, sorry, hmm, oh, that way, sorry, okay, uh, ah, inspire and motivate, and I was like, okay, that's quite a tall order, yeah? I don't really, hmm, do I have to come up with a TEDx kind of presentation? So I thought instead of trying to inspire and motivate you, which I'm really uh, feeling a little bit nervous about, I thought why don't I just tell you guys about what has inspired and motivated me for the past year, and uh, what I, I hope will continue to inspire me over the years ahead, which is this movement called uh, Hutan Itu Indonesia. So Hutan Itu Indonesia came about from a challenge. Yeah? The challenge is uh, there is a study in 2015 that indicated that Indonesians see forests as mainly trees. What I mean by Indonesians, Indonesians in cities, urban consumers. Um, they undervalue the, 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 um, the forest and overestimate the value of uh, plantations. So if people only think of forests as trees, that means if you cut them out, if you cut them off, that's okay, we can just plant and we'll all be fine, right? While forests actually, as you all know, I'm sure, have this very um, comprehensive values uh, of uh, ecological functions as water, retention, water, keeping the balance of nature, as well as carbon, as well as the biodiversity, but also as a link to a lot of cultures across Indonesia. We can actually say forests are part as Indonesia's identity as a nation. So our challenge was, how do you get Indonesian public to care for forests? They are one far, yeah? Physically, therefore, half, the, half of Indonesians actually live in uh, Java now, where we don't have a lot of forests, and they're invisible. Yeah, uh, mo more than half of Indonesians now uh, live in urban centers. They see more uh, concrete buildings than lush green landscape. Yeah, um, why we think it's important to get them to to understand more about forests because if you do, out of sight, out of mind. If you don't know something, you won't love them. Yeah. So our challenge is how to get people to love forests when they feel that if we lose forests, it doesn't affect them. For something that's happening over, uh, and, and anyway, the damage happens over a long period of time. This is, a, this is a challenge for a lot of environmental issues, right? If we want to talk about environmental issues, usually something you won't immediately uh, feel the effect and, um, and it will happen over a long period of time. And this, will, this is the same challenge if you want to communicate about peatlands to get people to support peatlands. So uh, in talking about activism in Hutan Itu Indonesia, uh, as young people, I still consider myself as young. Um, yeah, really. Um, ooh, ooh. Whoa, what happened there? I really didn't touch anything. Come back, come back. No? Oh no. This thing is really not communicating well with me. So first what we look at was, um, 
We uh, back, back, back. Rick, can you help? Back, 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 back. Ah, ah, stop. You. Okay. No, no old people is as undignified as I am, I'm sure. Okay, so first what we're looking at is what you enjoy doing, yeah? When you're talking about activism, a lot of times it's the things that we do outside of our work. We already uh, have to go to study, we already have to work nine to five, more likely seven to six, you know? So it has to be something that you enjoy doing. And then you overlap it with what you're good at. Because we believe if it's something that you're good at or something that you want to be good at, then it's, you will put more heart in it, you'll put more energy and time with it. And the next is, of course, what do you want to achieve? Yeah? You also want to achieve something. So there, is this, there are these three circles, and in the middle, now there's your sweet spot. Yeah? Where you, in, 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 in Hutan Indonesia, we have 13 members of core team, which includes a graphic designer, uh, a videographer, a photographer, a former musician, a PR professional, an environmental consultant, a communications consultant, I'm one of them. And so we have this sweet spot with a lot of skills that can work together, right? But still, it's not enough, right? It's not, we, we can't have every skill that we need within our core team. That will make such a massive core team. But that doesn't really matter because you have your sweet spot, you have also other organizations' sweet spot, and you have other individuals' sweet spot, which makes a very delicious pan of pizza, of a collaborative project. So at Hutan Indonesia, we believe, we really believe in the power of collaboration. Yeah? We work together, then we, we can create something bigger, much bigger. And here are some examples from our activities. Oh, by the way, we are only one year old. We are a very young organization, one year old. Um, so last year, we wanted to create a running event. So we want to create a fun event with uh, an environmental message, which is you run to adopt trees. One of our core team is a runner, but we have never done a running event. And making a running event at a public place with hundreds of people, that's actually quite complicated. So what did we do? We connect with the running community in Jakarta called Fake Runners. Don't ask me why they're called Fake Runners. They really do run. Um, but they were like willing to help us because they enjoy what they're doing, running. Yeah? They are very good at it. And although what they want to achieve is different from us, they don't have any mission to protect forests, but they have a mission of uh, creating more events for their community members, right? So together, we create this event called Kulari Kahutan, which in one day... Mm, oh gosh, this thing... Ah, we had 600 runners who ran 5,000 kilometers, and in one day, 1,039 trees were adopted. And these are trees in intact forests, most of them. Yeah, forests that are managed by communities, uh, advocated to indigenous communities. <coughs> Excuse me. So another thing, so we thought, okay, how do we, do we bring forests to the people? What do we like to do? All of us in the core team, we love to eat. You guys love to eat? Yes, okay. So... People really like eating, right? They like to see something pretty and they, put, they take pictures of it first, put it up on Instagram, you know? So we thought, oh, there's a saying in Indonesian, if you want to, to get somebody to like you, reach them through the tummy, right? So we want to get people to love for us, so we, get, we reach them through the tummy. So, but even though all of us at Hutan Indonesia, we love to eat, we don't know how to create these dishes. So we collaborate with chefs who get, who, who get these forest products from all over Indonesia and create this amazing three-course uh, meal for us. <coughs> we invited the media. 
And so we got them to experience for us through their tummy. Yeah. Okay, and the last example was something that we are very proud of. We are still coming down from this super high from a major concert that we had on Saturday, which I think some of you actually attended. <clears throat> so the idea was, after the tummy, you reach the tummy, how do you reach the heart? So you reach the heart, we thought, oh, why not through music? Like, everybody knows how it feels, how, what song, oops, what song you sing when you what song you sing when you're feeling in love or when you're depressed and you're heartbroken so what we did was we we wanted to bring forest through music what we wanted to bring was like four musicians um, to the forest get them to experience the forest the biodiversity get them to talk to uh, local people the culture experience the culture as well and get them to write inspiring songs about forests. But it was, well, one of us is a forest musician, uh, not forest musician, one of us is a former musician. So she had the first link to everyone, yeah? But we can't do it alone. So what we did is like we started getting in touch with these people, with these musicians, and surprisingly, well, I find it very surprising, they were very welcoming to the idea of going to forest, living in a camp for five days. <laughs> then we got collaboration with one of the major media in Indonesia who went with us through to the forest and created this web series. You can check it out, check it online. It's eight to ten minutes videos of the trip. And I have to say that these art these musicians, it's not as if they're people who are used to being in the forest. This left uh, sorry, the, the one on the bottom, she was actually actively really scared of going to the forest, yeah? She had never been there, so she was like, uh, you know? But because she likes the idea and she supports the cause, she was willing to go with us. So they went to the forest, they uh, created songs for us, and then with the help of a lot of other musicians, uh, we had that concert on Saturday. Not just musicians, we were also assisted by this, or, this organization, Sakar Kawung, who actually helps uh, sell cloth made with uh, coloring from the forest, and they created the design of the costume. Yeah? So in that, we got four songs for forest, two, 22 web series videos, 1,100 audience, and we also get the audience to, um, um, the, the ticket sales was used to um, adopt trees as well, 240 trees were adopted in that one night. So what we have learned so far, first is <clears throat> collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. I cannot stress it, we cannot do it alone. No, not, we won't be able to do everything by ourselves and it's much more fun actually when you, we work together, we see this vision coming out together. Second is to make it fun. Because we will be doing volunteering work, we will be doing work that we don't have to do, actually. We have to have fun, right? And believe me, people will respond because they see you're having fun, yeah? And the third, and I think this is really important, we have to go beyond our echo chamber and which is why what we will achieve as well with collaborating with organizations that we usually don't collaborate with, running communities, chefs, um, fashion designers. We will spread the message and get more people to care about the forest. We cannot just speak to our echo chamber. That's it from me. Thank you very much. That's our website. Feel free to check it out. Thanks. Thank you for Leonie Aurora from Hutan Itan in Indonesia. Now we have a second speaker to about, uh, talk about the environment. We have uh, Manuela Sinta from Ranuelum Foundation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. 
Hi. Young people, right? Hi. Hi. Okay. I believe the young people um, have special power. I always believe that, but uh, first, uh, let me to introduce myself. My name is Shinta. I come from Kalimantan Island. This morning, you have listened uh, some stories that I told you about the situation that happened in Kalimantan and what we are doing um, as a young people who were born and grew up in Pitland area. So, um, um, actually, we are in the same age as well. Um, my organization also just one year old. <laughs> yeah, it just yesterday, you know, one year old. But the thing here is um, how we start. I would like to start with uh, some short stories. Also, how we start everything, you know, because uh, when we talk about about pitland, like uh, mentioned in previous lecture, it said like pitlands landscapes means different to different people. And when I'm here uh, talking to you, I'm, I'm going to talk from my perspective as I am an indigenous person. I'm an indigenous woman that was born in Kalimantan and grew up in Kalimantan and see the pitland around me. It's more than only a place where I grew up. That's a part of our identity. That's a part of ourselves and we cannot just live it. We cannot just separate it. So uh, this organization just started uh, from the crisis that happened in 2015 that I think that uh, most all of you know about this, the situations that happened in Indonesia and happened in central Kalimantan in 2015 where the forest fire and pitland fire, pitland burning and the toxic haze was very thick where Everyone was suffering, dying of the haze, dying, starving of oxygen. So my, uh, I could say like my organizations and our movement start from a very crisis point. We come from a very painful experience. It's not something that, hey, uh, we are good in this, or we are... Uh, Special in this, like I'm so interested in what you explain. It's very important for us to know uh, what things that we good at, right? But our experience is quite different. It's not because we know that we can do something, you know. But it comes from very painful spot, painful place that we come up as an organization, as a movement. Um, I would like to show you one short video first. It's only one minute, and I already asked for operator to play it. And after that, I will like explain more. Just voice from the heart of the haze, Kalimantan. Halo, nama saya Sinta. Saat ini saya tinggal di Kalimantan, di Kalimantan Tengah, di mana sekeliling kami PSI level sudah pernah mencapai 2.900. Dan bukan hanya PSI saja, tetapi bagaimana keadaan kota Palangkaraya ini sendiri menjadi kuning, menjadi gelap, segala sesuatu tidak terlihat karena tertutup oleh asap. Banyak sekali anak-anak yang sudah terkena dampak asap di sini, bahkan sampai meninggal. Kalimantan Tengah adalah paru-paru dunia. Dan kami tidak seharusnya untuk menghirup asap dengan jumlah partikel 2,5 itu mencapai 1 juta, PM10 mencapai ribuan seperti itu. Anak-anak kecil, orang dewasa, orang tua yang ada di Kalimantan bisa menghirup oksigen, bisa menghirup udara dengan bebas. Tanpa harus takut dengan resiko kematian. Saya percaya segala sesuatu bisa diubah. Dan kalau kita bersama-sama tidak ada satu hal yang tidak bisa dilakukan. Ya, yeah. <laughs> uh, video pendek ini dibawa oleh uh, partner kami dari Green School International Bali di Paris Summit uh, berapa waktu yang lalu dan uh, ya seperti yang I, I'm sorry I'm speaking <laughs> speaking bahasa I'm sorry <laughs> okay because I I just watch I I was speaking bahasa in the video and I forget I'm in English session. <laughs> Right. Okay, so this video was broke by my friend from Green School uh, International Bali to um, Paris Summit 
And yeah, like what you saw in the video, that's how the peatland burn in there. And actually, uh, what we are doing in our foundation, when we start, we just, we just uh, you know, at the time, we're desperate about the situation. And we just think, uh, do we want to be uh, silent victims or we want to do something about this? The choice is in our hands. So uh, I, I taught you this morning, we start by cooking cooking uh, for the local firefighters because at the time we had no idea about how to fight the fire in pitland areas. So uh, we only know how to cook. Yeah? And then we cook and we broke the food. But when you start to do something by small things that are already on your hand, the next doors will be opened. That's what exactly what we experienced. We started with the food. And then at that time, the health uh, mask come to Palangkaraya. We have mask in our hands. What we want to do with the mask? So we broke the mask to the villagers. We, we traveled, we ride the bike for hours in that kind of very bad situations to broke the health for the villagers. So that's how our works on activism started. For I myself, I have experience in journalism, and also I'm, I'm doing filmmaking, I'm doing video making, and I also uh, work as an activist in one NGO. But when we talk about the movement, especially here, the movement of young people, uh, it's, it needs more than you see, as, you see activism as a job. No, that's a passion. That's something uh, inside of you, the reason for you to do something, the reason for you to voice about something, to voice about forest, to voice about people, to voice about the pit and fire that happens. So that's one thing that motivates me. And start from that point, uh, we just, you know, like gather our friends from school, from universities, and say, okay, now we are in this situation, what we are going to do? And, okay. We do what we can do and start from that point. Uh, many helps come and uh, yeah, that's a very long story, but I, I just want, make to, uh, want to make it brief. Uh, the Run Volume Foundation just founded last year, exactly in May 2016. And our focus is in doing advocacy works. When we talk about advocacy, sometimes we think so high, you know, huh, advocacy, it means uh, change the policy in, uh, parliaments maybe, or maybe in like president's decisions maybe. But actually it's not that, that difficult to do advocacy works. What we are doing is we have the communities there, a uh, young indigenous uh, community, uh, filmmaking, and I kept telling to, to the young people, um, what do you want to say about the situations around us? What do you want to, to be heard by the world about us? Just put it, just keep your idea. You write it down, let's make a video. And uh, yeah, it works. When we start to, to bring the stories, uh, activism started, you know, we use the video to educate people. We use the video to give information to the people in Palangkaraya because, in Kalimantan, because not many people that know why fire happened. Even us, even me, previously I didn't know, three years ago I didn't know why fire happened in Petland area in my place. But we, we realized this is information that needed to be uh, known by people. And in this case, our role as young people, we look at the power of young people. We are the only ones that can travel uh, so far. You know, Kalimantan is a very huge island very huge island and to move in one district to one district you need to take like one hour two hours three hours to reach the villages to reach the regions and we realize that we cannot just rely this information and this kind of solutions about pitland fires and about helping people the suffering by the haste only to our government so by the the, the yeah volunteers with the volunteers uh, we come up 
we do the works, we collecting the stories, and we bring the stories through YouTube channel. We know now we are in digital era. You have social media, you have YouTube, you have you have Instagram, you have Facebook, we have website, and we we bring the stories through the uh, through these platforms so the voice can be heard. So here, why pitland becoming our concern? I would like to highlight that pitland is more than something uh, that everyone should protect because it's worthy to be protected, you know. I mean, sometimes you say, hey, we have to protect the, the pitland, but why? This question, many, many, many times this question uh, have been asked to me. And when I answer, I always say, because the pitland is the part of our lives. And I don't know about what you have in your heart when you are sitting here. Why are you concerned about pitland? Is that because that's your major? Is that because um, you have to learn about pitland in your university? Or there's something inside of you that you say, Oh, this is important. So this is like a not, not question that should be answered, but just to be reflected for each of us here. Why we want to protect the forest? Why we want to protect the pitland? Why we care about landscape? And why we want to protect the people? And uh, I would like to show you one more video. Do I still have time? Okay. I want to show one more video. Uh, the short one? Cannot. Cannot. Okay, it's okay. Actually, this video only one one minute, but it's okay. Uh, this video is about the footage that what we did during the haze time crisis in 2015, and this film entitled "When Women Fight." It's not fighting <laughs> like this, or you punch someone's face, no. But uh, this film about the youth act campaign that we we started last year. So this youth act campaign has a very simple idea. We are young people who reject to stay and do nothing. But we want to do something. We move with one ultimate goal, to stop, to end forest and pitland fire and toxic haste that already happening in Kalimantan for 20 years. Oh, you love because it's 20 years. That's true. It's 20 years. I'm 24. So I have been exposed by this fire and haze since I was four years old. So this is a kind of movement and, and I really encourage you. Um, yeah. What you want to do about this? When you are sitting here, what do you want to do after this event? I don't have any theories. I don't have, you know, any like expert analysis. I talk based on my experience. You have power. We have power. Collaboration is very important. I agree with Mbak Leonie. How we can make this is a global movement. Let's think about it. For us, as we, we are on the ground, we will do what we can do. We go to schools, we go to universities, we talk why fire happened. We educate students. We go to the villages and bring this information to the farmers. We build haze shelter, clean room in Palangkaraya. And I keep talking about this wherever I go, just like what I'm doing now in front of you. Because I believe when you hear the stories and your heart is touched, is moved, it's hard to not do something. Someone cannot do all things, but each of us always can do something. So let's decide what we want to do after this event and for the next days ahead. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you for Manuelis and Ted for giving us insight this afternoon. And now we have an interactive session. 
So if you have a question, we open for the question, first question first. There's no question. It's very clear. <laughs> okay. Hello. Uh, I'm Jack and I'm from the Philippines. Um, uh, to Miss uh, Aurora, my question is to Miss Aurora. Uh, I really like your presentation. I was really also inspired uh, about the three overlapping circles on the, on the things that you do on, uh, on your passion and the, the things you really want to achieve. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, we're going to um, uh, establish a new NGO. And I was, I was thinking, what if, uh, uh, how do you start in, uh, how do you start your organization, the Hutan Itu Indonesia? And what are the challenges you face uh, during, uh, as a new NGO? We all know that an NGO doesn't start as a, you know, very known or very famous that even a major media can partner with you. But how do you uh, communicate or collaborate with other agencies or other organizations as a new NGO? And, uh, and how did you overcome those things? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. What was your name? Jack. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Jack. Thanks a lot for the, for the, for the question. Um, how did we start? We started really as a bunch of people feeling that we need to do something. Really, it was just us sitting in a room. Actually, have, we invited people to have dinner together. And we see there is a gap because we see that we saw that how can we say to people that you have to care, that we have to try to reduce deforestation when people don't even know what are the values of forests? How can we get them to, um, to appreciate that something is being lost when they don't even know what is being lost? Yeah? So it's really just a bunch of people coming together. Uh, I think it's the same progress you, you see a need and you want to do something about it. And there were a lot of challenges, of course, but we really, one of the most, what I find really most amazing is the outpour of support. So when we decided to form Hutan Itu Indonesia, it was three weeks before the Earth Day last year. And within that three weeks, we actually could host a launch where 300 people attended, there were music. There was music. There was a talk show. There was a, um, uh, a film screening, and there was a, another event at, at America. Um, but what we see, what you said as well, the doors start opening once you decide you want to do something. Of course, there are challenges. Uh, one of the challenge for us was we didn't have a legal entity, so it was very hard actually to raise funding. But what we did with that was we had another organization just directly paying for stuff for us, yeah? So we can do, you, can, you can do it through other organizations while you're trying to set up your, your establishment. That was one challenge. Another challenge was that the fact that there were only 13 of us. <laughs> if you imagine like doing that uh, running event, that was really, you need a lot of people, yeah? It was a five kilometer loop, and you need people all around, giving people water, like organizing uh, food, and, and getting people to register, et cetera, et cetera. But I really see this, this, this passion, this, this um, I really see this increased uh, volunteerism in Indonesia, and I'm sure as well across Asia Pacific. Because I remember when we were doing that running event and we thought, okay, we need volunteers. It was our first time, yeah, trying to find volunteers. We are an unknown organization, born in April, trying to do this uh, event in June, like in two months, right? So, okay, let's just ask around for volunteers. And we sent around just WhatsApp messages, put it on PATH and Facebook. And within 24 hours, we actually got 40 people who want to help us. These people who don't know us, we are not famous, 
right? They just want to do something. And they came from outside Jakarta. They came, you know, they will travel 25 kilometers to Jakarta for our technical meeting. And then they will come at 5 a.m., you know, 4.30, no, 3, 4, oh, yeah. I mean, a really, really ungodly hour early. And they, they, they were willing to do that. So that what I find so amazing is that the doors will be open. People want to collaborate. We just have to provide them the means and the opportunity. And that's it. We can do a lot of things with that. I hope that answers your question. OK, thank you. OK, because uh, our time is limited, so we just can open for the just one question. So, yeah, thanks for this two remarkable and inspiring speaker. Give us a lot of inspired today. So the power of the collaboration, how we can do with our the fun things and take a step to make our better futures and better world. And now. Please stay in here, so because uh, we have a uh, token to appreciation to our two remarkable student, uh, speaker from our project officer, Tommy. Please come to the stage. Okay, I'll, thank, you. thank you for the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay, after we got uh, inspiring from our two speakers, now we have a next agenda is this discussion. Uh, at this discussion that we will separate into uh, groups. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, still waiting to open the slide. Okay, uh, in here, there's the, we were separated into the group, so you can find your name and which group you are, so you can choose the round table. So there's the Philippines, uh, these are like the red colors and orange and so on. So you can start to join with your group. It's same like uh, the name in this slide. Okay, we, can we start now? Yeah. Come to this. Okay. Yeah, up here. So you can take your microphone, please. Just one person. One person. Okay. Okay. You can start. Right. Three minutes. Right. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am my, I'm John Michael M. Cornito from IFSA LCFs UPLB, and here's our output. Um, in here, 
Um, according to DENR, the DENR or the, the Department of Environment and, and Natural Resources, the depart this is the department in the Philippines that, that is responsible for supervising and managing projects or pro programs concerning activities or, pro uh, activities or programs concerning the use and, develop uh, and development of countries' natural resources. According to them, there are two identified major sites in the Philippines, uh, in the Philipp of peatland ecosystem in the Philippines, the Agusan Marsh and Leyte Sub A Basin. In here, it can be said that studies concerning peatland ecosystem in the Philippines are still lacking. That's why there is a need to fur do two further research in here. This is also to protect the peatland ecosystem from degradation. In here, after uh, after further research, uh, there's a need for us to to in, uh, there's a need for us to increase awareness on the uh, uh, increase awareness on the importance of the peatland ecosystem. Like what, especially the people in the Philippines, because I know that there's uh, there's uh, I I know that people in the Philippines are not yet informed with the importance of the peatland ecosystem since uh, research in about peatland ecosystem are still lacking and next is when the uh, when the peatland ecosystem are already identified in the philippines uh, there is a need for us to conduct a focus group discussion within the local community within the within the within the uh, within the peatland ecosystem uh, and this, this is also for them to know the importance of the peatland ecosystem and also for them to protect the to protect it and uh, yeah this uh, this is uh, how we want to do uh, this is how uh, this is how we want to this is the how to we want to spark action within the within the Philipp, uh, with uh, with the Filipinos in order for them to know what it, uh, what it, uh, what is the pit, uh, what are the what are the importance of peatland ecosystem and in here are the organization our organization of cplb uh, uh, conducts conducts uh, the same thing uh, like for example we like for example the okay. information dissemination about environmental issues like the csop the community school outreach program we extend the field of forestry to other to high school students, like uh, because uh, 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 high school students, uh, the high school students in the Philippines are do, do not know what is forestry, and we also conduct conference for us to to disseminate about environmental issues, and we also conduct mangrove tree planting for them to know, uh, for them to know. And we, we also conduct mangrove tree monitoring and mangrove tree monitoring for us. <laughs> okay, guys, your time is up. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And let's invite the next group to present about what about the idea. And we invite from the Philippines, Amar, Michelle, Alisa, Princess, and John. Please come to the States and tell about your idea. What's your action plan? You can take your microphone, please. This one person, two. Uh, one person, one and Hello. Hello. Um, hello, we're from the Philippines. I am Michelle Lapis and we'll be talking about peatlands in our country. There are seven peatlands um, in our country, but we chose Agusan Marsh because it's the biggest and it's in the heart of Mindanao. And under um, RA75, it's 86, it's um, a protected area in the Philippines. Agusan Marsh, we, we saw two problems in environmental issues and managing issues of the area. In environmental issues, whew, in, 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 <laughs> in environmental issues, flooding, mining, poaching, and unregulated migration is present. And in management issues, which we will be um, more talking about more, because we think that 
um, lack of information and land conversion is is a big is a big problem in managing Agusan Marsh or peatland the peatland we chose for this presentation. Our solution is to to have more information dissemination of what a peatland is because um, honestly in our honestly in our country we are not that aware of what a peatland is but it is declared a protected area but most of the filipinos are not aware what are the benefits we can get from um, peatlands we can get aesthetic value from the peatlands biodiversity values um, um many wait um it serves as carbon storage for for uh carbon fixation uh, it's good for hydrology and water uh, water retention, something like that, and so and it's more socioeconomic values. Information dissemination through forestry extension will is I, I think is our solution, and of course, because there is lack of information, we should um, conduct and the government should provide more research studies about peatlands in the country because that is where change will start. Um, the government should be the one, one stepping ahead left. of us. So one minute. Huh? <laughs> ayo, uh, ayo. <laughs> so that's, that's our solution. We should disseminate more information about peatlands and the government should fund more research studies about peatlands so we can be more knowledgeable about peatlands. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we need to do a research study about the pit land in the country. So next group we can present uh, this is a group from Philippines, which are Ramon, Mark, Aurenil, and Jack. Please come to the stage. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, mom, she's. So, uh, we're, uh, again, we're from the Philippines and we, are, we will be talking about the problems uh, that we think are uh, uh, in the Philippines right now about, about peatlands. So first, uh, lack of awareness about peatlands. So basically, we, think, we all think that uh, uh, Filipinos are not that aware about peatlands, about uh, what will happen if we will not manage, we will not sustain peatlands. And... Uh, we think that this is the re the uh, the root problem that we all should be aware of the concept of peatlands, and we think that uh, the solution is IEC or information education and and communication because uh, we know that uh, all of us should be aware, and especially the Filipinos should be aware of the concept of peatlands, and we think that. Uh, the DN DENR or Department of Environment and Natural Resources should be involved because uh, they are the main uh, they are the main uh, department that should be uh, giving information to the Filipinos and uh, of course the IAC materials that and also we should consul consult the stakeholders and uh, like uh, we can have uh, seminars we can have symposia that uh, will. Uh, will give information to the Filipinos. And next. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, illegal logging and shifting cultivation. Did you know that uh, the community, you will not just uh, force them to go to the city and uh, take a new job instead of going to the pitlands and get other resources. Communities will always uh, stay in that side and then, and then uh, what what resources near to them is to, uh, is actually what they utilize, they use. So uh, they uh, they used to illegal logging, they used to shifting cultivation. They make it as a charcoal, uh, char very charcoal uh, illegal charcoal making is really uh, you know famous or uh, famous in the Philippines. And um, one solution that we uh, see is the stringent law implementation of the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources. And, the, and to increase manpower in, uh, manpower like the forest guards who protect the, mount, uh, the peatlands. Because uh, there's, there are only like two, two or one in, in one mountain. Two or one forest guards in one mountain. And that's really crazy. That you cannot control uh, uh, 
all of that, uh, all of that big area, if there's only one forest guard, and that's we need. That's we need to increase the manpower. Number three is the sustainable livelihood. Um, we can think of something that is uh, renewable, that is sustainable. Instead of cutting those trees, maybe we can, you know, uh, inf uh, uh, invite them to have a uh, sustainable livelihood. And we need the Forest Management Bureau. I'm sorry, guys. The NGOs, your time is up. CSOs. All right. And the LGUs. Thank you. Because we are running out of time. Yeah. Uh, we're going, yeah. Another one is live, wildlife poaching and so response action by the stakeholders on the pressing issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we invite from the Indonesian group Ms. Jeffrey, Putu, Yushrin, and Atia. Please come to the stage and share about your idea, your action plan. Good afternoon, guys. So we are from the IFSA LCUGM Indonesia. We have this project called ICASA, or Integrated Conservation and Social Act. What? First, we want to choose the mangrove ecosystem as our place to, to, did this, to do this project because of Yogyakarta itself didn't have peatland, but it, but it has some of forest like mountain forest, mangrove, and etc. But it, it doesn't have pit, it doesn't have peatland. First. The activity that we will conduct is workshop. The workshop will be something like discussion about the people, the local community. We will talk heart to heart about their problem in the ecosystem mangrove. And we can give suggestions to this local community why mangrove is important, why we have to save mangrove for, for bad people or dangerous things that could make the mangrove is not, not exist. And the second one is environmental education for children because we know that children is our next generation they will preserve our life they will they will continue our purpose to life our why we our what is it our purpose our purpose to life and they can share the information they can share the idea to generation so the preservation of mangrove will be will be in lifetime not just in some generation or something and next about the mini village uh, mini village library, we think is that it, it is uh, really important for us, like uh, we can share to the uh, people around, I think that it's not only from the, uh, it can uh, conduct from the Yogyakarta uh, citizen and then we can make some poster and then in that poster, when you donate some of book uh, to the village and then we can give you or maybe we can uh, invite you to planting and also to ring the mangrove. So it means that it's a really, really integrated the processes around that. And the last one, the fourth is also, I mean, the, the planting and the touring is when you give the, the book to, the, to us and then we can uh, invite you to planting and also touring in the mangrove. And then the last one for the research. And for the research, we know that Without the resort, the ecotourism, the mangrove system, it will be not have, what is it? It will be not continuing it as scientifically. But we, when we do it, when we do scientifically, it will be based on research, based on data, so it can be continue time to time, and it will be in everyone's mind that this research is kind of uh, memorable memories that we can know from this research how important mangrove is and how the local community can manage this mangrove ecosystem. So re research uh, conduct for the student because we are the student and also the forestry student and then uh, for the effect or I mean for the, the next time of this research we can give the more contribution to, to the local community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next group is Said Nur. Yunanda, Sophie, Sarah, and Sahar.
Oke, okay, hello guys. Hello. So this is from our group uh, about the Fitlands. So about Fitland, why can this happen? We have to uh, like this is happen because human activity. You know, uh, human always do something that will give a bad impact for our land. And then we have like uh, unregulated farming. You know, like unsustainable farming. Then. We have a uh, lack information, then uh, also dry season. We can expect uh, for dry season, so it always happen in every year. And the next topic. So what is thing that matters? So we need to solve this bit land fire. So thing that matters is that does the Particle matters and toxic haze and wildlife and drought, it's all the danger for human and also for uh, wilderness. And so we need to solve this. We need to solve this by law enforcement. As we know that the regulation in Indonesia is still lack of law enforcement. So from the first step, before the prevention step, we need to do the law enforcement. And then the participation. We need to make ensure that the society inside uh, this area and also the student, uh, uh, all, all the society inside this area will participate in pitlands, in saving the pitlands. And so we need to educate the people, we need to make advertisement. To develop an issue, we need to make this issue as a matter for all for all, for all society, so that this issue will may will have an importance. So they will think about it, and then they will. Oh, we need to. Uh, although this is not our problem, we still need to do something to help. Uh, to help to. Uh, to help to solve this pitlands fire, and then silviculture treatments. As for, we know that from the first session, we know the silviculture treatment to help regulate the peatlands. We can, we can use, uh, we can use silica and then compost like that to plant the peatland without burning the land. So I think we give the solution for peatland fire. Okay, thank you, thank you for the idea, for the great idea. And the next group we have uh, from Japan, there's a Misaki, Theodore, Takase, Kohei, Kawaii, Tomonari, and Yutaro. Is it right I'm spelling your name, guys? Okay. We thought uh, such project, Yurukara project, because uh, we have a uh, point of action in Japan. We have the little pit one because uh, we have history of uh, that we converted the pit one to the farmland of cultivation. So, first, first, first of all, we have to uh, catch the public attention using such cute character, people see this character, ah, what, is, what is this character? So using this character, we, we think that we can catch the public attention. So and you, uh, when the, uh, we uh, catch, pub, catch public attention, uh, it has to, this character has no copyright people you can easily easily you, you this character so the uh, gradually the public attention get broad and second uh, we have to give information about the pit round what is pit round and the uh, how can i say mm, pit uh, pit round road or importance of pit round and people as people get more get to know more about the peatland, uh, people how can I say 
people value the peatlands and uh, uh, how can I say it? Okay, <laughs> and uh, and sadly uh, we can do the collaborative action because uh, now that people get to know the peatlands. So, for example, we think about uh, uh, bird watching activities because uh, bird watch uh, uh, like bird watching birds, so they uh, they can easily uh, collaborate the such project. And after that, we can uh, catch uh, companies donations or companies collaboration collaboration because uh, uh, we now value the peatlands roles or we know the peatlands importance so companies or enterprise uh, have have uh, advantages to uh, give donation to such project. I'm sorry, so guys, your time is up. This is uh, our project to conserve peatlands. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you for the great Yurukara project. This is very nice, guys. Uh, okay, we invite the next uh, team. Is uh, from Short Korea. It's a Jong Gun Lee Jin So Shin Shin Dong Gun Uhun Cho Ko Yung Tak. Please come to this stage. Okay, aku feelingnya benar ke? Tunggu aku mau sembunyi aja mau mudi. Please tell me if I wrong to spell your name. Hello guys, uh, I'm, my name is Jin Sushin from South Korea, Ipsa CNU. Uh, we Korea have very little peatlands, so we discussed the problem of Korean forestry. And uh, from 1960s, uh, we planted very successful as, and it's uh, kind of incredible. And, but uh, it has a problem now. There's a uh, pinus densiflora, 60%, and pinus rigida, 16%. So the kind of forest, uh, kind of trees are really simple. And the problem now nowadays the problem is climate change, and the trees are uh, trees have low income, econ low economic value. So we have to do regeneration, like these happy trees, but uh, there, uh, the people uh, who are living in Korea think cutting trees means destroying nature. So, but we need to regenerate these, these trees, so we should inform them the uh, cutting, cutting trees and like that doesn't mean just destroying nature. So, uh, we will inform, in, enlighten the people through SNS, uh, especially card news from Ipsa Korea Facebook page. Yes, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, okay, we invite from another girl from South Korea. Please come to the stage. Lee Yong Yu, Kim Ji Hyun, Kang Da. Oh, oh. 
Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jiyoung Kim from South Korea, IPSA, IPSA LC, KNU. And so what we can do for peace land as a youth in South Korea. Um, first, the problem. <clears throat> Actually, the peace lands really exist in Korea. So that was the problem making this PPT. But yeah, so actually, yeah, peace friend rarely exists in Korea. So most of our nation haven't even he he heard of it. Um, so how um, there is no recognition of peace friends in Korea. So how to deal with how to, so how to deal with it? Um, still, peace trend is really important for its bio biodiversity among many factors. So we should promote the importance of so we should so we should promote the importance of pit rent so that make the nation recognize the pit rent and ultimately um, ultimately we have to preserve preserve the biodiversity and the importance of uh, and and its value of pit rent and um, so, so okay. So, so how can we how can we promote the uh, how ca how can we promote the importance of peace rent? Um, we thought of two two solutions. How um, through social media like uh, Facebook and Car News and Lucius, so that we can promote the importance of peace rent and also uh, making the picket and poster. Um, so that we can market, we, we, can, we can promote the importance of peace rent in action. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So, we have a group from Taiwan. Please, Chang Chung Yung Yi Li Yan Yu. I'm sorry, I don't know how to spell it. <laughs> Shen Xiaoying, Xiaoying, you're right. Xi Xie Huang. Hello, everyone. We are from NCHU in Taiwan. And because there have no pit land in Taiwan, so we choose another very big issue, that is the PM 2.5. You know, and the reason we have four major reasons for the PM 2.5 in Taiwan. The first one is the trade wind, and everybody knows that there have trade wind in every season in Taiwan. So this kind of wind will blow the PM 2.5 from other countries to Taiwan. And the second one is the factory. Because there is many, still many factories in Taiwan, and we also have some many big power fire power plant. So we produce we produce some P, some PM 2.5 ourselves. And the third one is the old motorcycle. You know, just like in the Indonesian in family in Taiwan, sometimes have two to three motorcycles themselves. So this make the situation worse. And the fourth is the topography. You know, in Taiwan, there is a very high mountain on the middle of Taiwan. And so the PM 2.5 were block in the mountain, and it was stuck in Taiwan and can't dismiss. This, this so and now is the solution. We have four solutions too. And the first one is Gogoro. You know, Gogoro is a scooter powered by the electricity. So it will not release the carbon. And everybody knows that there is a very high density of convenience store. So we combine the convenience store and with Gogoro. You can change the part, your, your battery in the every convenience store. So this make the rider very convenient. And the second one is you bike. You know, in Taiwan, the government arranged many bicycles called you bike in many area, and it is it is free at the first hour. So many people choose to ride the you bike instead of driving driving a car. 
And the third one is the subsidy for buy new scooter. You know the old, bicycle, old motorcycle produce more carbon than the new one. So the government in Taiwan says it is okay. It will pay you money if you change your old motorcycle to a new one. So this led people in Taiwan is okay to change a new motorcycle. And the last one is the afforestation. Uh, Taiwan's government really make a lot of efforts in the afforestation. And we do have a very good policy in protecting our forests. So these four solutions makes the situation stop getting worse. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The last group, last but not least, we have Veronica, Desmond, Vivian. Okay, and we are going to talking about a problem in Taiwan. Uh, just like the uh, last group say, we don't have the pitla in Taiwan. So we are going to talking about um, the low forest regeneration rates. Uh, in Taiwan, our uh, regeneration, uh, uh, our domestic timber production is less than 1%. And, <laughs> and the aged tree is, um, because in, in Taiwan, our law can like our law can like cutting down a tree, so our tree just like be older and older and be, and now and after uh, the uh, after like after we can use the tree uh, like it's over ages, so the economic value is being low now. Okay, and it's cause uh, it's just because. Uh, in the past, we are overlogging. We are overlogging, and so after 1990s, uh, we ban. We ban the. Our law just ban our. Uh, we can just, <laughs> just uh, ban in logging from 1990s. Yes, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so after the government ban logging, there there is this problem of uh, low forest regeneration rate. And the government is trying to like uh, remove the ban, but then the public is against it because they think that uh, cutting trees is not good and we are harming the forest. They don't understand that after we cut trees, we can plant new trees and regenerate the forest. So the solution for it, uh, we think, um, we thought of three steps. The first step is to educate the people. We like to hold talks in schools so that we teach children at a very young age about this new concept. So they bring the new concept to the family and they, the family will understand more and then they can teach it to the next generation. And we would like to hold public activities to raise the awareness of this issue. And the second step is to do some promotion through social media. For example, we will have videos to, um, by experts talking about the importance of forest regeneration and the importance of cutting trees when we need to do it. And we also want to have collaboration with um, some artists or some uh, singers, maybe, to raise the awareness. So the final goal is to amend the law with the uh, public um, supporting us. So this is our presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the last group. So, okay, guys. So I hope all this idea can you apply to your countries. This action, so we can make a better future, so make a better world for us. So yeah, we have a closing from uh, Peter Holmgren at, as the Director General C4. Please, our closing remarks will deliver by your sir. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. It's really great to see all, all forestry students here, and I understand you had a great session today. Uh, I hope you also enjoyed the conference we had um, on, on peatlands, and uh, um, 
the new, uh, shall we say, new uh, way of running a conference that we put the people that matter most first, the community people, and listen to them. And then we ask everybody else, what, what are you doing and how can it help? So we hope that you, you, you found that useful and, and uh, hopefully you will pick up some of that when you yourselves are, are out there and, and uh, um, as graduated foresters. Um, an another thing I want to say to a group of forestry student is, students is that these days we very often see forestry only as an environment thing. At least that's what the media tells us and what we hear when we are debating things. Um, we should always save the forest, but and we should. But that's not the only thing we need to do. We also need to manage them. So sometimes I say that a well-harvested tree is not a loss. It's a gain in renewable materials and sustainable landscapes. And I think that is something that we as foresters need to, need to carry forward, that yes, trees, we need to save them, we need to, we need to, we need to protect them, but we also need to use them. So, Great to see you here, uh, and, uh, and I really look forward to, to see you all coming out as uh, graduate foresters and, and working to, to, uh, for sustainable landscapes in the future. Um, that's all I had to say. There was some talk about uh, closing session. Yeah. Is that okay? Okay, anyway, so thanks a lot. given by uh, our if president of IFSA LCIPB. First, thank you for, for, for to give a 